Coming up, is the Rudin 26 better with Zeb Wise in the seat? We'll get into the numbers. Plus, another young driver is set to make his World of Outlaws debut. And we'll talk Monday iRacing results and the win prediction formula. Let's go. It's Tuesday, August 30th. I'm Justin Fiedler. This is Dirt Tracker Daily. I've had a few different questions in recent days about Rudin Racing and the switch from Corey Eliasson to Zeb Wise behind the seat with the All-Stars. So I thought we'd dive into that today. I know we've uh, I've talked about doing a mailbag episode, so I probably need to stop using some of these questions as show topics, but this one feels like it needs a little bit of space and we can go a little bit more in depth here. Rudine and its struggles in 2022 have been show topics for me a few times this season. We talked about this originally on the Daily back on June 7th and what it would take for that te uh, team to climb out of their hole. But then by June 30th, Rudine announced it had released driver Corey Eliasson after more than three seasons together. And then it was about a week after that on July 6th that the 26 team uh, dropped the news that they were hiring Zeb Wise to replace Eliasson. The new partnership got off to a solid start with a 7th place finish at the Brad Doty Classic with the Outlaws, but the Kings Royal after that was a bit of a struggle with only one feature appearance at a 20th place finish in the daytime show before the Royal. Zeb made his first all-star starts for the team at Lake Ozark on July 22nd and 23rd, finishing 3rd and 6th, both very solid results. Since then, though, things have been very up and down. The team has only added four more top 10s and they've got three finishes of 20th or worse. Plus they missed the feature at Knoxville on July 30th. So with 12 all-star races together so far, is the Rudine car better with Zeb Wise behind the wheel? The short answer here would seem to be no. This season, Corey Eliasson had 27 all-star races in the 26. He had 12 top 10s and five top fives. They also won at East Bay early in the year. So they had a top 10 percentage of 44.4%, a top 5 percentage uh, of 18.5%, and an average finish of 1196 Through 12 races with Zeb, they have six top 10s, one top 5, and no wins. So that's a 50% top 10 percentage. That's a little bit better than Elias. And they've got an 8% top 5 percentage. That's worse. And their average finish is 11.91. The caveat, though, in the average finish is that they missed the feature at Knoxville. So that average finish, while it looks very similar to Elias and 11.91 to 11.96, it's actually a little bit worse than that with the B main finish. If you're curious about Zeb also before the 26th when he was running his own car, his average finish was nearly two spots better at 10th. He also had two wins, 18 top 10s and 12 top fives. So where has this team gone wrong? Without really knowing the inner workings, it's tough to say, and I would even go so far as to say the team isn't sure here either. If they knew what the problem was, they would fix it. You know, they use Maxim chassis, they use Speedway engines, they use FK shocks, all of which we've seen plenty of other drivers and teams have success with. You know, I, that's kind of where we are in sprint car racing. A lot of the really good stuff you can just buy off the shelf. So there doesn't seem to be an equipment or even a funding problem here. I think somewhere along the way between the personnel changes and the driver swaps, they've obviously gotten off and they're struggling to get back to when they were fast and right in the mix for the all-star titles. That blue 26 is a staple in sprint car racing and it sucks to see them down right now. I think if a lot of us hope that Zeb would bring kind of some fresh energy to this team and they would get back going in the right direction, but that hasn't been the case so far. I'm just hoping here that Kevin Rudine has some patience with the situation and allows these guys some time to figure it out between the crew guys and, and Zeb as a driver. And the All-Star season continues later this week at Sharon Speedway, so hopefully these guys can get going in the right direction uh, there in Ohio before they then go back to Pennsylvania after that for uh, things like the Tuscarora 50. Draw me a comment. Let me know what your thoughts are on the Rudine squad and whether you see them able to kind of fix this stuff going forward. The World of Outlaws Sprint Car teams are headed west this week to begin a three-week stretch on the West Coast, starting with this weekend's Skagit Nationals at Skagit Speedway in Washington. Yesterday, we had two drivers announce their intentions to challenge the Outlaw full-timers, with one of them making his series debut. First, California driver Joel Myers Jr. will run most of the Outlaw shows coming up in the next few weeks with this weekend at Skagit being his series debut. The teenager has made a bunch of 360 and 410 appearances this season, including starts with both NARC and the Sprint Car Challenge Tour. He's still seeking a win in 2022, but does have top five and top 10 finishes. Leighton Crouch, who is Brennan Crouch's father, has kicked in extra support from Myers with his High Plains building division. And the Crouch family has also fielded that number 11 Sprint Car this season that we've seen Buddy Kofoid in a bunch. So that High Plains building division is something you may have seen before. 
The plan is for Myers to race at Skagit, Chico, Hanford, and Placerville. And then the other driver we'll see coming up is J.J. Hickel. He's partnering with Dave Smith Motorsports to run this weekend at Skagit and then the two nights at Gray's Harbor Sunday and Monday. That Sunday show at Gray's is 360s, while the Monday race is the Outlaw Show. Hickel is from Washington, but has raced in the Midwest this season with Brandon Eikenberry, appearing 13 times with the Outlaws already, plus a bunch of weekly appearances at Knoxville. Hickel was also one of three rookies to make the Knoxville Nationals A-Main a few weeks ago. And also, I said on yesterday's show that Ryan Timms was likely headed to Pennsylvania next, but that might be in question now. I was told late last week that PA was, quote, probably next. Uh, but Timms mentioned heading west after the Sunday race at Houston, so maybe they decided to chase the Outlaws after all. We'll just kind of have to wait and see what happens coming up. I'll have more on the Outlaw Weekend at Skagit on Thursday. Last night was round number six of the iRacing Award of Outlaws Late Model Championship, and it's becoming increasingly clear that this title will come down to the two teammates in Evan C. and Blake Majulis. The two drivers together uh, under the Chris Ferguson eSports banner and their Majulis C Speed Shop. They entered the night 1-2 in the standings, and they left 1-2 in the standings. They also finished 1-2 in the race, with Majulis earning his third win of the year. He started on the pole and battled early with outside front row starter Zach McSwain, but it didn't take long for the 127 to settle in out front and go the distance. C started fourth and eventually finished second. Majulis only gained three, uh, three points on his teammate with the victory, but he still got four races left to make a move. The two drivers have combined to win five of the six races with Hayden Cardwell, the only other winner. Majulis now leads the series with three victories, but C hasn't finished worse than second yet this season. The other battle to keep an eye on if you're tuning into these races is for that 15th position in the points. And I know that sounds kind of weird. Why 15th? Uh, but kind of like soccer, these pro series with iRacing have relegation. So if you finish inside the top 15 in the points at year's end, you are guaranteed into the next season of racing. If you're outside of that top 15, you must then go back through the qualification process. So right now, Matthew Selby has the final locked in spot, while Justin Norwood and multi-time sprint car series champion Alex Berger are on the outside looking in. Uh, the series goes quiet for the next week, but they will return to racing on September 12th at Knoxville. These races are always live streamed on Dervision uh, and on YouTube, and you can watch them for free. As you guys know, I pretty regularly do win picks for the bigger series here. Obviously, the series that are in the Word of Outlaws or that are in the uh, DirtTracker.com analytics database. And that means a selection from me and a selection from the prediction formula, you know, each week, each race. The formula is something I put together a few years ago now, and it uses the data available from the nearly, at this point, almost 1,300 races that are in the database. And I've talked about this before, but maybe if you're newer and you don't know this, the formula takes into account past finishes at that specific racetrack. So say the World of Outlaws are going to Eldora, we'll take into account past Eldora races. It also takes into account past finishes at racetracks similar in size and a driver's last five races, period. So we've got races at that track, races at tracks similar to that track, and then just your last five races, period. Just kind of so we have some momentum in there. If you sprinkle in a little randomness, uh, which I do in the formula, then you've got, uh, you know, kind of all of the parts and pieces that make that win prediction happen. This season, I've been tracking the picks, uh, which I did not do last year, but I have a whole spreadsheet with all of the picks. And as of today, for me personally, I'm 47 for 209, which is about 22.5%. The formula is 25 for 209. That's about 12%. And I think it's an interesting thought experiment. And even when the picks are wrong, I think it gives us an idea of who, uh, who could be fast. Last week, I had a comment from Matthew on YouTube, basically saying that he thinks those past results can't predict the future uh, and that it's more intangible things that are what leads to race wins. And on some level, I agree with him. Just like anything else, sports results, the stock market, you know, all of these uh, other things, past results don't really mean much in terms of what could happen in the future. But as I just said, I think they can give us an idea who is good at certain tracks and who has momentum and, and who could be challenging for the win. And I think this past weekend was a perfect example of that with Tanner English. He's a driver with the Word of Outlaws Late Models who has been good as of late. And it felt like his first win wasn't that far off. I picked him to win Thursday and he ended up winning Friday, which then led to the formula picking him for Saturday, which he also won. There's no way to have a math equation be accurate enough to pick every winner, but I do think there is value in the numbers. I built the analytics section over at dirttracker.com because that information wasn't easily available other places, and it's allowed us to spot trends with drivers, make win picks, and come up with correlations and theories about the way races play out, the difficulty of running various series, and a whole lot more. And if you really paid attention the last two years, things that have come up on this show because of those numbers then often percolate up in other places. You know, the series talk about these things, you know, the media outlets talk about this stuff. 
When you can take the race results apart and really get into what's happening by the numbers, you often spot things before the media and the series do. So am I or the formula ever going to be 100% accurate picking winners? Absolutely not. If it were that easy, we wouldn't need to run the races. We could just say Brad Sweet's going to run that race or Jonathan Davenport's going to run that race. Plus, half the time, we don't even know to 100% certainty who's even going to run the race on any given night. There, there were, it was just a, an example here a couple weeks ago where I picked Greg Satterley to win a race he didn't even show up to. But I do think there's a lot to learn here from the, uh, from the numbers, and I th uh, I'm going to continue sharing them as we go along. I think it provides a lot of really unique insight. A quick schedule note for you today, the Short Track Super Series was supposed to be at Georgetown Speedway tonight, but that event has been pushed to tomorrow because of evening thunderstorms incoming. So they will now race on Wednesday, and then it will be a quick turnaround with $25,000 on the line on Sunday at Utica Rome. For more information about the event and the series, head over to shorttracksuperseries.com. There are just two shows on today's streaming schedule. There is action from Lernerville over on SpeedSport and Flow Racing 24-7. To see the full daily streaming schedule with links to watch, visit dirttracker.com slash watch tonight. That's it for the show today. Have a good Tuesday. Make sure to like, subscribe, and comment on these videos. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. We'll see you tomorrow for more Dirt Tracker Daily.